the July edition of the Roar Community Call. Um, we are happy to have you. We're going to give you several updates on Roar. Um, just a little bit about, um, uh, about these calls. As I mentioned, uh, please do introduce yourself in the chat if you haven't already. Tell us who you are, where you're joining from, how you're using or planning to use Roar. We are always very interested in that. Our agenda today, um, as more or less is, is fairly customary, we're going to give you uh, some general updates, some technical updates, including on some thoughts about API credentialing, curation updates, including a call for proposals, uh, uh, a call for feedback on a proposal for adding additional external identifications to Roar, some exciting adoption updates, uh, and some featured uh, integrators uh, doing presentations about their use of Roar. And then we'll have uh, a few minutes at least for some open questions. And uh, at that point, we'd love for to hear you just chime in informally and tell us anything that you're doing with Roar or planning to do with Roar. Um, we hold these community calls every other month. Uh, they are um, open for any anyone to register. Um, they're primarily a chance um, for us to update you on what's going on, but also uh, a chance for you to uh, tell us what's on your mind about Roar and, of course, to see uh, the community demonstrations of actual Roar integrations. Uh, we announced them on the Roar Community Forum, which is a Google group. Uh, we encourage you to join that if you haven't already. And uh, we always put them on our events page on the Roar website and announce them on social media. Um, so you can, we usually schedule them uh, quite far in advance, so if you like, you can register um, beforehand. We, this is a meeting, not a webinar, so we encourage you to chat with one another in the, in the Zoom chat. And in fact, if you do have a question, uh, you can use the React button to raise your hand and we can call on you. Uh, but usually we do like to save uh, questions and answers until the very end of the meeting. Um, call, these calls are recorded. Uh, we're reminding you, you should have gotten that notification when you joined. And then afterward, we will publish the slides and we will post the recording publicly and we will send them as well by email to everyone who's registered. We ask you to abide by our, by our code of conduct. Uh, and then we do also encourage you if English is not your primary language or if you just uh, prefer to see it in another language, uh, remember that you can click show captions in Zoom to show uh, captions in your own language and that works fairly well. There's plenty of ways you can get involved beyond these calls, including submitting feature requests and bug reports on our roadmap, uh, posting questions and sharing information about your use of Roar on the Roar Community Forum or in the Roar Technical Forum. Uh, all of you are invited to get involved in registry curation. We have an open request uh, queue. And of course, you can always tell us about how you're using or planning to use Roar by submitting the Roar integration form. And we can share some of those links in the chats. Uh, chat in a bit, but probably most of you are already quite, quite familiar with these. All right, so uh, I'm going to give uh, some general updates now. Um, some exciting news is that Roar is a finalist for the ALPSP, otherwise known as ALPSP Award, for Innovation in Publishing. Um, we are, you know, really thrilled with this. Uh, this is an honor and uh, we're glad to be in some good company with some really exciting new tools. Um, so Maria, our director, uh, has given a, a presentation to them um, arguing that we should be awarded this, this award and is going to continue to, um, uh, we'll go through that process and we'll see uh, at the Alps meeting uh, in September is when the winners are going to be announced. And we think that's uh, a, great, a great honor for Roar. Um, there are several upcoming events for Roar, uh, the next one of which is tomorrow. Data sites open hours are uh, on July 17th. Uh, I've forgotten the exact time, but I think it's 3 p.m. UTC. I think it's at the same time as this call. And uh, a lot of the focus in that call will be on Roar. We'll see featured presentations from Dryad and Zenodo about their use of Roar. Um, there's also a course coming up on querying open metadata. APIs. Uh, I'll be teaching that in conjunction with Luis Montilla from Crossref and Kelly Stathis from Datasite. It's a three-day course, uh, really just three hours, um, and really geared at sort of introductory API queries. Um, and uh, I think we've got um, 
something like 50 registrants for that already. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, you can already uh, register for the September Roar Community Call. Uh, we are tentatively expecting to hear from Web of Science, which is doing a lot of work to integrate Roar into its, of course, widely used discovery system, and the Czech uh, National CRIS system, some representatives uh, either from the National Tech Library there from, or uh, other folks from Czechia who are interested in using Roar to track um, their research outputs nas nationally. Um, so those are all listed on the Roar events page. Feel free to visit that. And now I'm going to hand it over to Liz, who will tell us about uh, technical updates. Liz, I'm going to pass uh, slide control over to you. Okay, thanks, Amanda. Um, so for those who haven't been here before, I'm Liz Krasnarich. I am the technical lead for Roar um, and the lead developer, only developer. Um, so we don't have a lot of new stuff going on in the technical side right now because we uh, you know, launched the first new version of the Roar API and schema in the spring and then spent a bunch of time doing some cleanup and, and you know, kind of uh, code cleanup and also cleaning up bits and pieces that were left over from the switchover um, process. Uh, but we do have one big topic that we've been looking at, which is API credentialing. Um, so for those of you who aren't aware, our API is completely open. Uh, you do not need any credentials of any sort. You do not need to identify yourself in any way to use the API, which is kind of an uncommon case generally across you know, APIs. But in this open scholarly infrastructure world, it's a little more uh, common as a way to reduce um, challenges and barriers to entry. Uh, that means that we receive constant use all day, every day, which is a great thing. Um, and we, as Roar becomes more popular, that use has you know been continuing to to increase, um, and that introduces some challenges. Um, particularly, impolite use of the API is becoming a little more common. It's not the standard, but um, it's an increasing problem that causes stability issues for everyone else using the API. And what I'm talking about is things like people using proxies to conceal their IP addresses so they can send multiple or send uh, requests right up to a rate limit for multiple IP addresses and then change the IP addresses so they can continue to beat the rate limit and send um, huge batches of requests uh, that are largely for the same things over and over and over again. Um, this is not what I what I would classify as malicious traffic. It's just impolite and irritating uh, use of it. Um, most of the time, handling this is a game of whack-a-mole that involves me, um, you know, manually uh, changing the rate limit or blocking specific uh, IPs, which is not a very sustainable way to go about maintaining um, you know, stability of the API uh, in the midst of these kinds of problems. We do have a rate limit. It is 2,000 requests per five minutes. Um, and that rate limit is quite high, really, for, um, for APIs generally. It's meant to support cases where you want to process large, large jobs and send a lot of requests. But we're getting kind of to the point where um, we need to get a better handle on um, managing these cases of impolite API usage. Uh, so we have been looking into options for some very lightweight API credentialing. And what we're looking to do is not so much um, truly authorize or authenticate users and use it as a way to like restrict services, but we are um, looking at ways to better identify users because right now all we have is IP address. Um, so when somebody's doing something impolite or weird, like sending a whole bunch of, you know, many, many millions of requests that are badly formatted and are not going to produce good results, we have no way to contact um, people and either uh, ask them to ask them what they're trying to accomplish and it, it give them some pointers on how they might be able to do this better, or you know, at least ask them to do something in a different way that's not as um, not as intensive on the on the APIs. Um, so we're looking at, at several different options that would um, most likely involve adding a, an additional header or parameter with your uh, API request that allows us to identify where it's, where it's coming from um, 
versus just looking at IP addresses, because currently IP addresses basically tell us you're using AWS or Google Cloud. It doesn't tell us much of anything about how we might get in touch with a um, particular user. Um, we will, however, always support uncredentialed requests. We've heard that loud and clear from some types of um, platforms, especially that uh, want to make it really easy for, um, for certain systems to set up with Roar. These are primarily things that have user facing type of heads where you can set a fairly low rate limit and that's never going to be a problem because a human user can't type fast enough to ever hit that rate limit. So we'll always allow uncredentialed requests regardless of what kind of credentialing we introduce. Um, those uncredentialed requests will have a lower rate limit than credentialed requests is the plan. Um, I I want to reiterate that this is not about, um, you know, preparing to charge for services or, or something like that. Our API will continue to be free of charge. Really what we want to, uh, what we're trying to do is ensure the health of the service and make sure that this free and open resource is um, accessible to everyone who wants to use it and isn't being, um, isn't being uh, used mostly by some folks and monopolized by folks who are not using it in a very polite way. Um, so uh, I do plan to have a, a an actual um, more concrete plan available for the next meeting in September. And like with all of our um, all of our major changes to um, tools and services, we will share that for uh, for comments and we'll um, get some feedback on timeline for introducing introducing that as well. So nothing happening imminently, but just wanted to let folks know that that is, um, that is something that is coming up in the, in the future. And that's it. So I'll hand it back to you. Amanda. Great. Thank you, Liz. Um, Adam, I'm going to hand, hand slide control over to you. Um, so you will be in control. We're next going to hear from Adam Buttrick, who is um, our, who is in charge of curation. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Adam Buttrick, product manager for Roar here based at CDL, still doing double duty on curation. So I wanted to take my time today to talk about our proposed plan to support additional external identifiers in Roar. Uh, so for some context, since Roar's outset, we've had requests to add additional external identifier values to the registry. However, it wasn't until the release of our API and schema versioning process, as well as some additional improvements to our curation infrastructure relative to the release of schema version two that we could ever really entertain doing so. Um, but with all of this now out of the way, we can finally have the chance to work on this kind of longstanding community demand to add these new IDs. And specifically what this means is better acknowledging all the kind of amazing descriptive work being done in nationalist, uh, national level and specialist identifier systems as the kind of sources of truth that feed, improve, and enhance Roar's functionality. So by adding these identifiers, we can take the deep expertise that's embedded in this diverse set of systems and synthesize them into a kind of comprehensive, globally relevant, and persistent means of data exchange. Uh, in doing so, we also hope to kind of amplify the value of the identifier systems that are linked to Roar better curate the registry through direct connection to these sources of truth and provide users with kind of a reliable, consistent way to identify and connect research organizations and funders across various contexts. Okay, so heading back down to earth from those lofty ambitions, uh, in order to effectively curate new external identifiers, we have to impose some you know, very basic constraints on how they would be added. So first we need uh, new external identifiers and their metadata to have licenses that support reuse. We need them to be accessible in public data sources and also uh, to receive ongoing updates. So we also want new external identifier values to you know, kind of demonstrate a clear value to uh, Roar's user and have widespread adoption either in the region or service domain. You know, if we're going to spend time adding it, we want to make sure it's uh, of value to our users. But this can be evidenced by things like use at the national level or integration in other commonly used research infrastructures. So assuming a new identifier can clear those hurdles, the proposed means of incorporating them is fairly simple. We use the same format as our existing external identifier values in schema version two and just expand the controlled list of types supported therein. 
Uh, per our schema versioning policy, uh, adding value here does not require a new schema version, so we don't have to increment the schema, do anything in our API besides add those values to the controlled list. Uh, in terms of the next step, we have a draft curation proposal, which I'll throw in the chat. Oh, great. Thank you, Amanda. Um, uh, that you can provide comments on until the 16th of August. This includes additional details, examples, and links to our documentation to help clarify kind of all the policy and data and curation concerns. If you just want to skip the discussion and exclusively propose that we add a new external ID, this can be done in the Rural Roadmap repository using our new issue template, which I'll throw in the chat. Uh, uh, if you've already proposed that we add a new ID, don't worry. As part of our review for this project, we're also assessing outstanding requests for adding new external identifiers. I'm mean, kind of seeing which ones we should kind of tackle first. Okay, that's all from me. Uh, we maybe have time to take one or two questions on this topic. If anyone has them, feel free to also pop in the chat and we can address there. All right. Um, thank you, Adam. I just want to mention too that um, although the link in the chat is to specifically um, request particular identifier schemes or generally sort of um, you know on the roadmap, you can use the roadmap to submit any other feature requests, schema change requests, or bug reports if you like. So for those of you who are new to Roar or who are new to the Roar roadmap, please do feel free to look around in that roadmap and see. If there's anything existing that um, is something that you would like to plus one, or if there's if you'd like to add something else. Okay, and we'll send out lots of reminders about that August 16th deadline for uh, for feedback on this proposal. And meanwhile, we will move ahead to adoption updates, which is me. Um, so just a few of the notable Roar adoptions in the last uh, couple of months. Um, one of the biggest ones is DSpace 8. Um, DSpace Chris already supports Roar um, and has just for a few months, actually. Uh, and we have Andrea Bellini here, um, who is from Science, who has been a, a, fa a fabulous supporter of Roar and has, whose, whose company has made sure that uh, Roar is supported in these very widely used open source systems. Um, so Andrea has kindly offered to answer questions about uh, the DSpace um, uh, integration for you, but I did also want to promote uh, an event that's happening on July 31st, which is sort of an open Q&A about DSpace 8. Uh, and I put a link in the slides, which we'll share after this. You can probably Google it and so on. Um, uh, I don't think I have, oh yeah, I do have a link for this. Uh, let me share this. Uh, you can register for this session here. Um, so that's coming up on July 31st. So you can uh, just ask questions about DSpace 8. And we may do um, more uh, work to uh, promote this because I know that this a lot of people are very, very interested in this, this integration. Um, so congrats to Forescience and to Andre Bellini and to the whole DSpace team um, for getting this through. Um, it's very exciting and we hope lots of people uh, begin to use it. Um, also, uh, the American Physical Society, uh, which uh, publishes about 20,000 articles per year, um, so a very um, quite large uh, society publisher, uh, has integrated Roar and are pushing those to, data, to uh, Crossref uh, in DOI metadata. So we're going to hear more from them at the end of this call, but we're very excited about this. And I just want to say, too, we are so grateful to the American Physical Society for their support. Arthur, you have been a gem. You really have been a gem. Arthur is a very active member of our curation board. Um, so I think everybody should sort of give Arthur in particular a round of applause, <laughs> perhaps in emoji reactions here, uh, because we think you're, um, we rely on you probably even a little bit more than we should. Um, I can't react while I'm presenting. It's just a little too, little too difficult for me, but thank you so much. And we're really thrilled about this and we plan to uh, um, promote this heavily as a model of things that particularly scholarly publishers should do. Um, we are also going to hear um, about another notable uh, adoption uh, in a system called CurveNote, uh, and I won't say more about that now because I, I think CurveNote is such a really fascinating platform, uh, and we have the, the founder of Cur CurveNote here uh, to talk to you about that also at the end of this call. 
I also wanted to give a little shout out to a project called Open Syllabus, which has been around for quite a while and is just a, essentially a sort of an online web accessible database of, of syllabi um, that are used in higher education. It's a really tremendous resource and I think was actually founded by somebody that I used to work quite closely with, Dan Cohen, uh, but has really grown since then. And um, Open Syllabus is using ROAR to sort of help identify, you know, the organizations that where these syllabi have been created and are used. And one of the interesting things that they did sort of in conjunction with that is that they're using IPEDS identifiers um, and they created a file for mapping, which are US only and only for educational institutions. And there is a file mapping those uh, IPEDS identifiers to ROAR IDs. So if anybody is interested in that IPEDS ID, we do have a list in our documentation of of um, external ID mapping files that people have provided. Some of these may be candidates for adding to war records, you know, in um, the phase of work that Adam was just describing. Some of them may not, but those, those files are always just useful. Here's a CSV file that maps these identifiers to war that may be all that some people need. So I wanted to specifically thank them and call them out for that. Um, if you are using ROAR, um, we would love to hear about it. Um, we have here on the slide, and I'll put it in the chat as well, a form for you to fill out to tell us about ROAR. You can also just email me at community at roar.org and let me know uh, what you're doing with ROAR. Um, I'm always trying to keep, uh, as Liz mentioned, you know, we don't always know who's using ROAR, and we just want to make sure um, that we've got everybody who's using ROAR listed, that we know what they're doing, that we chat with them that you know that we're here to answer questions, all that kind of thing. So if you are using Roar and you're not sure if we know about it, we'd, we'd love to hear from you about that. Um, so now we come to the chart part of the adoptions uh, presentation, which is I usually do. Um, data site DOIs um, with Roar as an identifier used for affiliations, uh, climbing, climbing, climbing up to uh, over 1.8 million. And again, I want to remind people, because I think I've been a little bit unclear about this before, these are the number of DOIs that have an identifier in the contributor or creator field that is a ROAR ID. Um, so some of those records may have more than one ROAR ID, right? So it's not the number of ROAR IDs, it's the number of DOIs that have at least one ROAR ID in them. Um, as a percentage, of identifiers. Um, ROAR is uh, by far the most widely used in data site records. Um, so these are data site DOIs that have any identifier used for what we call author affiliations, creator affiliations. Um, for that use case, um, ROAR is really uh, the number one thing. That little 13% uh, of records that are using grid IDs, those are mostly Figshare repositories that I think have not upgraded to like more recent um, Figshare um, versions that do use ROAR for that. Um, so that's probably what that, that is. Um, in Datasite, Datasite also supports ROAR IDs for funders. Um, and I'm, I'm always, I, th I think this is quite a large proportion given that the funder registry is so widely used as a funder identifier. But nevertheless, in data site records, um, nearly one third of data site records that have a funder identifier at all, which is of course not all data site records, um, of those records, nearly one third of them are already using ROAR for funder identifiers. Um, fairly recently began tracking ROAR IDs in ORCID. Um, as you can see here, this is going up and up and up, not surprising, but um, look at the timeline on this. This is really just since April. We've gone from um, 1.46 million ORCID records with ROAR IDs. Um, and this is, I, pretty much, we're pretty sure this is ROAR IDs for anything, for any kind of organizational identifier, not just affiliations, but also for funders, just like any ROAR ID anywhere in the record. Went from 1.46 just three months ago to 2.18. Uh, million this month. So that is increasing quite a lot. Uh, and in fact, you know, the similar chart here were as a percentage of organizational uh, identifiers um, is over one third. And of course, ORCID is still using Ringgold IDs for a lot of a lot of things, but those are no longer exposed in the API. So that uh, and I think they are planning to do a kind of a legacy matching of those wrinkled IDs to ROAR IDs as well. So at some point, this chart is going to get much bigger. 
Uh, Roran Crossref affiliation. So these are uh, DOIs that are registered with Crossref. Um, this has uh, been fairly more recent uh, than, than Datasite. You know, Datasite has been collecting rare IDs for a long time. We're up to over 127,000. And this is actually, I think, from about a week ago. And um, I always think the type breakdown is quite interesting. And I think it's good news, really, that uh, journal articles are the most commonly registered item type in Crossref uh, that have ROAR IDs because it used to be grant IDs. Um, the Crossref does register grants. Datasite also now register grants. Uh, but we kind of, I, I think we really want to see journal articles be the type of, we want to see publishers adopting ROAR more. And we are beginning to see a lot of movement in that area especially thanks to um, organizations like APS. And sort of on that note, I thought I would, this is a sort of a news, it's not really a chart, but this is just a metadata breakdown from the Crossref API showing the top contributors of ROAR IDs for journal articles specifically uh, to Crossref. We have mem representatives from Optica Publishing Group. Optica Publishing Group is, uh, uh, you know, the top contributor of ROAR IDs to Crossref metadata, um, and they do a great job. Um, we've got a case study coming out with them um, fairly soon. We do have Sasha and possibly Chris, too, on the call uh, from Optica Publishing Group. They are very careful about their metadata, and they've been sending those uh, to Crossref for quite a long time. eLife. Um, Center for Evaluation in uh, Education and Science is actually a Serbian organization. And then APS, creeping up in the leaderboard. <laughs> so uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, in a year they're, uh, they're giving Optica Publishing Group a run for their money. It's not a competition, but it's uh, just fun to see these, these figures. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand this over to you, Arthur, and I am going to give you slide control. So you should just be able to uh, click on the slide to advance it. And there you are, Arthur. Okay, cool. There we go. <laughs> so uh, we've we published journals well since before the society was founded. Physical review dates back to 1893, and uh, now is um, 17 journals, mostly under the physical review or PRX uh, grouping or uh, review, reviews of modern physics is a big review journal. Um, uh, our 20,000 articles a year makes us about the fourth largest publisher. We uh, are close to the uh, British Institute of Physics publishing, but uh, sometimes they publish more than we do. <laughs> so either third or fourth. Um, physics, astronomy, mathematical physics. And uh, we have an in-house uh, submissions and review system. And also um, for the online journals, uh, we do use external vendors for production of uh, chats XML and the uh, published PDF files. Um, so as far as institution records go, uh, we started, <laughs> we have a database that goes back to 1978, not all the way to 1893, but um, uh, back then we, uh, we started requiring, well, not requiring, but using uh, institutions to track corresponding authors. So one, there would be one institution associated with, with the paper, and that was basically to, to have a way to contact them um, through their, through their institution, if we needed to, uh, and to consolidate, I guess, address information, that kind of thing. Uh, so that gradually grew over the years, and around 2008, uh, you'll see we have, I put down modernize here, that's, um, the start of a discussion at APS on how to do a bit better with what we were doing with institutions. Um, there were editorial reasons also to uh, to track institutions because the editors prefer not to send a paper for review to somebody at the same institution as one of the authors. Um, so what we what we kind of worked on was getting a more complete institution database. We were we were probably only capturing about half of institutions for about half of papers. Uh, so try to get more complete. And then uh, around 2015, we got to the point where we we decided, well, we <laughs> we, we set up a, a internal institution database um, uh, that was, a, um, I mean, we, we already had an institution database, but we set up one that was uh, able to be used in the submission process as authors selected their, um, their, uh, their affiliations. Um, and we started requiring that for not only corresponding author, but all the co-authors. Um, 
if if there was a real institution there associated with it, they can always select <laughs> no affiliation if they need to. Uh, 2017, we uh, merged things, our, our database with Grid. And 2022 is when Roar um, was, was uh, we, we replaced the Grid re entries with Roar as that was uh, starting to be um, well, necessary because <laughs> Grid was no longer being updated publicly. Um, and the count you'll see on this graph, this chart is showing uh, the number of uh, distinct institutions used as affiliations in our published articles in that in each year. So it's grown much faster than our publications have, uh, because we're trying to capture all of the institutions, not just a small portion. Um, so that that uh, unifying that database with Grid and then with Roar um, was. Uh, a bit of a project. Uh, we had to, we had the goal of of not losing the data that we already had, um, but also you know adopting a new standard, um, and still allowing creating our own entries where needed because uh, we do we do tend to get either very small uh, things that uh, companies and independent things that um, probably don't or they aren't in row. <laughs> or they don't qualify, or maybe they just haven't been added yet. Um, so we, we do still create our own new entries, but most of the ones we need are in the standard database uh, in, in Roar. So uh, we actually went through Orgref first, which was a data salon um, organization registry, um, and then they mapped things to Grid. So that was our initial relationship set there. Um, we have on the order of a thousand entries that are not mapped to grid that we actually use. Um, and, and as I said, we, we still adding them. Uh, in fact, as we've gotten the, the, to this process, uh, there seems to be an acceleration in adding new institutions on our end, which probably uh, I hope will, <laughs> will come to an end soon, but just because our, our staff are being much more careful about um, uh, and making sure the affiliations are correct. Um, so uh, yeah, when when uh, people look at these affiliations, they'll they'll see basically a merged view of both both data sets. Um, and uh, roughly quarterly, we we match to the latest stump from Roar. I, I like to do it more often, but we haven't quite managed that yet. And then there's also subscriber data, which uh, I won't get into, but we're we've done some work on that. And hopefully we'll be more complete soon. Uh, a view of uh, what the authors see. There's basically a, a widget uh, attached to their submission. They um, they're asked to add affiliations, and there's a bunch of text there <laughs> that they probably don't usually read. But basically, they they have to. It's an autocomplete system, and um, uh, we added a filter by country, and then actually by city as well if uh, they select a country. Um, so you can see the. We're not the only American PH organization in Roar. Uh, <laughs> during the review process, um, so the authors typically submit a PDF file, um, and uh, the um, our, our staff look at that PDF and check that the stated affiliations actually match what's in the PDF, because sometimes authors just pick something random. <laughs> um, so here's a, an example with a list of affiliations. You'll see this five separate affiliations listed, uh, or at least five lines of affiliations. And then the um, on the bottom is, is kind of the view that uh, is showing our internal database and what, what those things are related to um, with our data. So, so our staff just make sure that those things match as far as they can. Uh, then it goes out to production. Um, we provide a metadata file uh, and an API for our vendors, production vendors, to um, uh, make sure the metadata is correct on on the in the XML. Um, and so, particularly for aff affiliations, um, in the XML, we we list them separately from the authors with an internal ID, uh, the institution name, and and the ROAR ID. Um, and then there's there's a link between the the authors, the contributors, and the um, affiliations through those internal IDs. 
So here's an example of what it looks like in the XML. Um, uh, so this is yeah, University of Iceland. There's Aurora for University of Iceland, and it. Um, yeah, one of the things that there's a bit of a challenge, and we get a lot of, <laughs> we've had a lot of feedback since we started doing this, uh, is matching that Roar ID, uh, matching the the text of the. Um, putting it in the right place, I guess, in, in these things, because you, you want it on the right affiliation. Um, so there was an example just this morning of a, uh, a, a facility at Cornell, which was used as an affiliation, but the affiliation didn't actually mention Cornell University, and the roar we had was Cornell University. So where does that go in the uh, production XML is a question. And we haven't actually answered all these questions yet. We're, we're still working things out. Um, but yeah, so there's a bit of communication back and forth with our production vendors on this now. Uh, but we went live with it back in May. Um, and so you can actually see it on our uh, journal article pages. Um, you see the author lists linked to ORCID if there is one. And then each of the affiliations, the, the blue there is a link to the ROAR page. Um, and it took us a little bit longer, but uh, we started positing in Crossref at the end of May and backfilled all of the ones that we had. So, uh, so that's done. So, I just want to recognize <laughs> we've been uh, eagerly uh, supporting Roar for a long time, um, and uh, but uh, we we have a, a good team of people who were involved, and this isn't everybody, but these are some of those who are most uh, most involved. Uh, and Colin is one of the ones on the call right now. Uh, but I'd like to thank everybody for their work on this. And if you have questions, uh, please, you can put it in the chat now or, or send me an email. Thanks. Wonderful. Yay. Thanks so much, Arthur. Um, I mean, I mentioned in the chat, uh, I, I don't know if we have time for um, maybe just a couple of questions, but I do know, I don't know if it's, if it helps, but at least that institution element in JATS is repeatable. Um, and Tara is asking sort of a similar question, like how do people are hand, handle hierarchies? So if somebody is saying I'm affiliated with X facility that's a facility at Cornell, but they don't mention Cornell, um, you know, how do you represent that? And it's, I mean, I think you can build tools to kind of traverse upward to say, well, this thing with Aurora ID has this many parents, um, but I don't know that everybody does that. Um, anyway, do you want to do you want to talk about maybe ways you're thinking of addressing that kind of problem? Like if somebody only cites a lower level child and not the higher level organization, like what are your thoughts about how to address that? Well, one, <laughs> uh, I mean, what we may do is just ask them to link the entire affiliation if they can't find an exact match, which. Right. I find um but it would be maybe a little weird to see you know facility <laughs> label in the uh in, as an affiliation and then you you follow the word link and you you see it's Cornell University um so I mean there are, the other option is just altering the affiliation in some way to to have the actual higher level organization shown um yeah yeah I'm not sure <laughs> yeah 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 um, okay, well, I see there is another question in the chat. Thank you, Adam, for addressing those. Maybe we'll have a little more time to revisit those. But uh, meanwhile, I would like to uh, pass things off to our next featured presenter, uh, Rowan Cockett from CurveNote. Rowan, let me give you slide control here. Um, okay, awesome. I'm uh, Rowan Cockett from CurveNote. I'm the CEO and uh, co-founder there. And we sort of do two main uh, parts of our business. Uh, one is on writing tools. And so these are uh, tools that allow um, authors to go in and actually edit uh, content and then be able to export that out into common formats, uh, PDFs as one of them from the user side, but we also support uh, things like JATS XML. And some of the uh, information and front matter that we collect are ROARs, and that looks quite similar to some of the integrations um, that have been shown previously. Um, and 
Uh, what's special about this writing and publishing platform is that we're uh, enabling a lot of computational content. And so that is through tools like um, uh, Jupyter. Uh, and if folks haven't heard of Jupyter, they won a White House uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, for Open Science uh, just a, in March this year. Um, it is used by many, many people to do uh, computational data analysis and then share that content. And the work that uh, Curve Note's doing through tools uh, like MIST Markdown are to integrate those practices into the sharing and publishing lifecycle. So a collection of open source tools that allow people working in Jupyter Notebooks to actually publish those things. And so as Curve Note, we're working directly with, uh, with journals and societies and lab groups to uh, wrap publishing sort of experiences around that so that they can publish computational articles as well. And so I'll show a little bit on the um, Markdown slide. Miss, Miss Markdown and Jupyter Book are part of the Jupyter ecosystem. So these are community governed tools that are hosted in the Jupyter community that we're active contributors to. And they really extend uh, Jupyter's approach. And again, that's data science tools, interactive visualizations to that authoring and reading experience. And so I think this is maybe a, a little bit of a different flavor from some of the things that are uh, talked about in the Roar community is that we're trying to bring these experiences much more into the author's environment. So we're, we're thinking a lot about sort of deep dive links, and this is all powered by structured data similar to, um, to uh, JAX but we're extending that to these sort of interactive experiences all the way through. Um, and so that's uh, sort of a very, very different way of working and sort of presenting scientific information that uh, is a little bit closer to the data science and uh, computational science domains. And what this also allows is that this can uh, be used directly in the uh, author's environment. And so they, they can go in and start creating these things, weaving in computational data, like um, array information, or if you have a, a statistic, you can actually integrate that statistic directly in there. And so as, as part of this community, we're also thinking about how that exists all the way through to the structured data in JATS at the end of the day, um, so that we can potentially show these in different interfaces. And that exists for things like inline widgets and uh, spark lines, like you're seeing this Apple stock graph there that's all hooked up to the computational environment. And what that means um, is that we can have uh, that those computations directly integrated into the reading experience. And so when I press that power button, um, that actually spun up a server in the background that can execute these papers. This is quite similar if folks are familiar with eLife's uh, executable research articles. This is a uh, initiative through AGU, the American Geophysical Union called Notebooks Now that CurveNote is supporting, such that you can, again, execute that and pull it all the way through. We're sort of thinking about this as how, how in from the author's perspective, do they get out to either any PDF template or JATS specifically? And one of the things that over the last couple of months that we've started to work on is integrating that directly with Aurora. And so in addition to the front matter, uh, authors can hover over any HTML Roar link to an ID and get information directly in that experience. And so we're, we're thinking about this a little bit more upstream than just the publishing experience, but how, how the author sort of interacts and feels uh, the Roar interfaces directly where they're writing. So I'll leave it there and take any questions. Very cool. Yeah, that computational first approach, I just think is such a fascinating thing about, uh, about Curve Note um, because those Jupyter notebooks in particular are so widely used in the scientific endeavor. Um, it's very cool, cool to see. Thanks, Amanda. All right. Um, well, I think we can just uh, open it up um, for for general questions. Um, if you do have any questions for our two featured integrators, we'd be happy to hear those. Um, I have seen a, a couple of things uh, going on in the chat, including uh, a mention of a, of a conference that's fairly close to me in North Carolina. So we're going to uh, take a look at that. 
um, and uh, that also has a virtual uh, component. So uh, happy to look at that. Um, one question I had is uh, whether anybody has suggestions or thoughts about external identifiers that might be good additions to ROAR. Anything people would like to see mapped in a ROAR record that isn't already there? I'll separately answer Emmanuel's question while people uh, ask that. Yeah, so yes, companies are in scope for ROAR, um, so long as they have evidence of research or funding activities. We have a number of companies in ROAR because obviously companies are, you know, uh, big producers of research. Um, so yeah, we just require the same kind of um, evidence of those research activities as we would for any other organization. Um, those are described in our documentation and the ROAR updates wiki, which I will throw in the chat so you can kind of get a better picture. Yep. Um, Chris Shulm has mentioned SAML entity IDs in the chat. I think that's actually one of the um, key, key types of identifiers that we are um, looking at adding in this round of feedback. Um, the others are that, that we're thinking about are RNSR, is that correct? Uh, which is a French national identifier. And what are the others, Adam? Yeah, so we've had a request to add uh, European participant, uh, let me actually open up my documents, so I'm not saying something, European Union participant identifier codes, and then unique entity IDs. Um, Yeah, both which of I which think, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think I think the first one is a European identifier, and then the second one is um, an American identifier. I always have. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Both tied to funding workflows in their respective regions. Mm -hmm. um, Reina is asking in the chat for organizations with more than one location: is it advised to have multiple ROAR entries or multiple locations for one ROAR? Adam, I will let you handle that. Sure. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the answer is it depends. Um, so some organizations exist co-equally in in multiple places. Um, so there are some examples of some universities that I can think in Europe that exist, for example, in two cities. In that case, um, we use multiple or we use multiple locations. Um, the same is true for certain types of laboratories or research infrastructure, um, where they essentially you know have monitoring facilities that are one thing that exists in multiple places. So again, another case where we use uh, multiple locations for companies that have national level manifestations in different things, essentially different version or different instances of incorporation. Then we create discrete records. Um, um, for campuses, we, we generally tend to roll those up to the parent organization unless they're located in, another, in like a completely different country or have some sort of extreme distance between their parent organization. Um, so yeah, it really depends. But for multiple locations, it's really about um, each, each kind of location being co-equal or constituent to the organization in order to be added. Do Roar connect to verified DNS entries too? No, um, we index domain data where you can maybe derive some of that, but our domain data is mostly derived from URLs or assertions of um, kind of email domains um, on, on websites. We don't do any sort of DNS, um, direct DNS connection. Uh, the IP registry might have some of that information, correct? Um, and then I'd like to um, open it up too for anyone to tell us about anything they're currently working on with regard to ROAR. Anybody have projects ongoing about implementing ROAR or updating ROAR in your systems? Always love to hear that. Ah, Peyton. Ah, yeah, good to hear. Um, integrating Roar into your DOI requests. I remember, yeah, we talked about that a bit in the, uh, this is uh, with sort of DOI registration managed by the Department of Energy in the United States, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yep, we will, we are always here to help with that. Anything else? Uh, 
um, Amanda Herford just getting started with Roar. Um, feel free to email us at any time, support at Roar.org, join our community forum or our technical forum. Uh, Amanda, uh, Peyton, let me just, I'll put in the email. And then Laura is asking, are Roars connected to decentralized identity issuer registries? I do not know. So the answer is no, not currently. We would need some examples, but we can look at um, linking them as part of our adding new external IDs um, if there's like a clear need or a lot of use. Um, Great. Well, we've got uh, four minutes remaining in the call. Um, so last call for uh, for comments, questions, etc. cetera. Um, thank you all. Thank you for joining. Um, do feel free to email us at info at roar.org for just general information, uh, support at roar.org for support information. And don't forget that our next call is September 25th. We will hear from probably uh, Web of Science and uh, and uh, the Czech National Library and or Chris system. And thank you all for joining us today. Great to see you. Take care.